Our next speaker has served as the 16th president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology since 2004. In 2006, she helped launch the MIT Energy Initiative, a $355 million effort to accelerate research, policy, and education to achieve a clean energy future. With her leadership, she has leveraged a top research university to become an engine of innovation and economic growth and is working to shape emerging national policy on energy and next generation manufacturing. On a personal note, I greatly appreciate her deep commitment, passion, and leadership on energy innovation, not just for MIT, but also for the whole nation and the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Hockfield. Thanks, Arun, for your kind introduction. And uh, most of all, I want to thank him, Arun, for his absolutely inspired leadership of ARPA-E. Uh, as a pioneering scientist and an advisor to the startups and venture capitalists of Silicon Valley, um, Arun, you've had a remarkable capacity to see the entire, the whole stem to stern pipeline of energy innovation. And that breadth of vision really goes a long way to explaining how ARPA E has become so effective so fast. So, for all of us focused on the urgency of energy innovation, it's tremendously exciting to be able to count on your vision and drive. And I want to tell you how excited I am to see all of you here today. Um, this has become an enormous conference, and um, it's incredibly encouraging to see the number of people who just, you know, like a magnet, are drawn to these gatherings around energy innovation. Um, it is fabulous uh, to have so many people leaning forward to a brighter, cleaner, economy boosting energy future. So uh, what Arun didn't mention was that um, almost two weeks ago uh, I announced I'd be stepping down as MIT's president later this year. And that decision has led me to reflect just a bit, of course, on uh, what happened at the beginning of my service at MIT more than seven years ago. And one memory really stands out more than the rest. <clears throat> and this was the clear, absolutely unambiguous message from MIT's faculty, students, staff, alumni that we needed to do more. We needed to really step up to the challenge of changing the world's energy equation. So um, after laying the groundwork of, for that in the fall, as Arun mentioned, of 2006, we launched the MIT Energy Initiative. We shortened it, shortened it to MITE. And um, MIT joined the emerging movement to invent a sustainable energy future. Now, all of you here are very certainly part of that movement. And you represent every sector, from founders to funders. And today, we're here to ask ourselves, how can we accelerate energy innovation? But before I try to offer a response to that absolutely critical question, I want to take a moment to reflect on just how wildly the world has changed in the last few years. Uh, so many of our fixed assumptions have become unfixed. And um, I want to consider with you four changes in the global energy marketplace in the last five years alone. First, the economy. Some of you may recall that in 2006, global energy demand was simply soaring, and there was no upper limit in sight. But three years later, in 2009, we found ourselves in the midst of a continuing economic downturn in which global energy consumption decreased for the first time in 30 years. And yet, despite the most serious recession since the Great Depression, oil prices have remained stubbornly high, underscoring concerns about the security of oil supply and the need to develop affordable, scalable alternative transportation fuels. And today, we see yet another phase of energy economics with the economy only very gradually regaining momentum, gas prices are rising so fast that they've become fodder in the presidential race. Policy represents 
a second area of marked change since 2006 and its effects on our prospects for game changers. When MIT began our new energy push in 2006, we hoped, actually, we didn't hope, we anticipated that the United States and other key nations would take concrete policy action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But as we all know, progress under the Kyoto Protocol has stalled, climate legislation failed to pass the U.S. Congress, and we now hold, frankly, very little hope of new energy or climate policy anytime soon. And that means that low carbon energy technologies must meet economic objectives early, and they cannot succeed if they only offer to mitigate greenhouse gases. A third and related change, the economic recession has exacerbated political opposition to spending mandates or subsidies, putting added pressure on the exciting renewable energy technologies. And while we're absolutely delighted to have allies like Representative Chaka Fata and Senator Chris Coons, their dedication to these issues is depressingly rare in Congress. The fact is that whether through new materials, economies of scale, or new distribution methods, renewable energy research must focus, above all, on bringing costs down. New entrant technologies must be able to compete on cost when they enter the market, or they're not going to enter the market at all. And fourth, unexpected change in the energy marketplace, another extraordinarily surprising change, is that the landscape for conventional fuels has turned out to be anything but conventional. Senator Newman reminded us just a few minutes ago, in uh, 2006, most people thought that North America was running out of natural gas and the United States was a net natural gas importer. Today, largely thanks to the development of affordable shale gas, the U.S. is now the number one gas producer in the world and recent assessments indicate that global shale reserves could significantly alter the geopolitics of gas. As a result, the U.S. is closer to achieving energy independence than at any time since 1992. And by some estimates, by 2020, we could surpass Russia as the world's number one energy producer. As MIT Institute professor and former CI director John Deutsch recently observed, the past image of the United States as helplessly dependent on imported oil and gas from politically unstable and unfriendly regions of the world no longer holds. That's good news. At the same time, we continue to feel the repercussions from the Macondo oil spill and in the wake of Fukushima, the long-term future of nuclear energy is uncertain. The upshot of all this, as we all know, is that conventional fuels will continue to be used for decades to come, meaning that the world still needs ambitious research on how to mitigate their environmental impacts. Now, I present this stack of familiar facts simply to say this. If the past five years have taught us one thing, it's that just about the only permanent fact in the energy landscape is the persistent and pressing need to design a sustainable energy future. So without policy and without subsidies on our side, how can we reach that future faster? Now I want to interrupt this doleful recitation to say emphatically that I'm extremely optimistic because America's innovation system has proven over decades to be remarkably resilient and adaptable. That said, if we want our innovation system to serve the clean tech revolution as effectively as it served the IT and biotech revolutions before it, we really need to tune it up, stem to stern. And I'd like to suggest five areas where we could make a few adjustments essentially right away. The first comes directly from our experience at MIT. University researchers pursuing sustainable energy alternatives should partner more actively with industry. We all know that energy incumbents and the aspiring newcomers often seem to speak entirely different languages. But if we want clean tech to succeed at scale in our lifetimes, 
we must draw on the market expertise of the companies that already deliver energy to billions of people. At MIT, we wanted our energy work to have a rapid impact on the energy marketplace. So from the start, we sought long-term strategic industry partnerships. We needed the energy industry's deep knowledge of global energy markets, and our industry partners quickly saw that they could gain much from MIT's research capabilities, as well as from our record of developing game-changing technologies and transferring them to the marketplace. As a result, we've partnered with more than 60 industry sponsors who together have provided more than $350 million in funding to support nearly 300 faculty and senior researchers working to invent a sustainable energy future. This openness to industry has implications for federal research as well. DARPA has long emphasized a hybrid model that brings breakthrough university research into collaboration with industry research, particularly through smaller firms and startups that can work on implementation and engineering. RPE clearly understands this model, and we need to propagate it broadly. The second recommendation I make is that government funding agencies also need to take seriously the market dimensions of sustainable energy. I know that Under Secretary Majumdar and Secretary Chu both understand this very well. But for decades, DOE has operated as a collection of silos, some focused on frontier science, while others are focused on applications, but neither having paid sufficient attention to the demands of the marketplace. Now, that could be one of the reasons why 30 years of 20th century energy research produced remarkably few scalable technologies. Could we start to see connections between the lonely silos? Well, DOE is pushing aggressively to put new talent, the very best university talent, on the task to advance the science in 46 new energy frontier research centers. DOE also understands that to take these technologies to scale will require the resources of more than any single research group, and so have created three, and we hope it will soon be five, energy innovation hubs. Ideally, RPE would function as a connector, spotting the best breakthrough ideas coming out of the frontier centers, then accelerating them for three to five years to get them into development and well on the road to commercialization, and then handing them off to the hubs in the applied programs to work with industry. So I'm absolutely delighted to see RPE actively changing the long-standing DOE model. Importantly, they now expressly reward research teams for pursuing the real-world problems of going to market, with cost defined as part of the technical problems to be solved. Together, these programs constitute and for this, DOE's leadership deserves all the credit. They constitute an entirely new model in government energy funding, funding, and one that should be further encouraged across all the offices and agencies that fund energy research. Third, we should seize the unexploited opportunities of using the sheer scale of government itself as a mechanism for testing new ideas. As just one example, consider building technologies. We all know that buildings account for about 40% of total energy consumption. But the construction business is overwhelmingly composed of relatively small operators who just don't have the capital and the research capacity to develop new techniques or technologies. Yet, the Department of Defense controls the largest block of buildings in the nation with 507 installations in every geography and climate. In a period of cost cutting, improving the energy efficiency of the military's 300,000 buildings represents a huge potential cost savings. What's more, unlike DOE, DOD has experience with test beds. It routinely creates initial markets for technologies it wants to develop. Each year, the Department of Defense uh, receives between 18 and 20 billion dollars in appropriations for new and rehab construction. And I wonder, could we leverage this funding to pioneer technology solutions that DOE, DOD urgently wants? Could we imagine this? Have a cross agency program between DOD and DOE. 
Well, we should all celebrate the fact that today DOD and DOE are actually talking to each other. That's good news. And let's press for even more talking and even more shared action. Fourth, if we want new energy technologies that can serve millions or even billions of customers, we must drive down the cost of production. And that means tackling the problem of manufacturing. Now, we're all familiar with America's innovation system. The federal government funds breakthrough university research, and that migrates to innovative companies which produce breakthrough products. Even now, no one in the world is better at inventing the new than we are. But there's another area, one that receives scant public attention, but I believe that's ripe for exciting gains through innovation. Our remarkably unsystematic system for remaking how we make things. This system, if you want to call it that, mainly in the hands of small and mid-sized manufacturers, focuses not so much on breakthroughs, but on incremental engineering advances in manufacturing technologies and processes, geared to driving down costs and relentlessly increasing product efficiency and quality. ARPA-E and our research universities are busy leading us to energy breakthroughs, but given that cost has become the do-or-die gateway to market success, we need manufacturing breakthroughs. We can't afford to assume that the current incremental system will somehow take care of itself. So just suppose that we brought the talent of the breakthrough system, the innovation system, to bear on the incremental system, our current system for improving manufacturing. And suppose we link the two. Even beyond energy, I'm convinced that our nation's economic prospects hinge on our ability to achieve a new generation of production breakthroughs. And the good news is that energy technologies would be an obvious early beneficiary. We simply won't get the benefit of breakthrough energy technologies without breakthroughs in production. So we really should start thinking about these two tasks as one. Fifth and finally, uh, we need to attend to what you might call the back end of the innovation system, the financing necessary for new technologies to succeed outside the, the laboratory. Now, another big change. If you'd asked me a year ago, or frankly anybody, you know, I might have been pessimistic. And some people persist in describing clean tech as an investment bust. However, recently released 2011 data show that clean tech simply stumbled in parallel with the whole economy. And with the economy now gaining strength, dollars are streaming back to the promise of clean tech too. In 2011, venture capital funding to clean tech companies not only recovered from the trough of 2009, but it reached an all-time high of $4.3 billion. And clean tech has maintained a steady share of total investments, accounting for roughly 15% of total VC dollars in 2011. Now, believe me, I don't believe that that's nearly enough money, but I have to tell you, we are not in the midst of an investment bust. Nevertheless, it's pretty clear that the VC industry will have to adjust its expectations to adapt to some of the harsh realities of clean tech. The model that worked for IT simply will not work and can't directly apply to energy. Energy technologies will never be a five years to IPO business. So the market needs to evolve viable investment models for long cycle capital intensive industries. Now, that said, I'm extremely encouraged to see the resurgence of VC interest and dollars. We couldn't do it without them. At the same time, we need to consider whole new models for financing the energy technologies we need. MIT professor Richard Lester and George Mason University professor David Hart have a new book called Unlocking Energy Innovation. In it, they describe a regionally based financing approach with multiple new stakeholders. And MIT professor Andrew Lowe has envisioned a new financing model for advanced technologies that would bring in a much larger group of investors, each making 
somewhat more modest investments in wide-ranging technology portfolios, and this would help better manage investment risk. With ideas like this in play, I have great faith in the adaptive creativity of the marketplace. On the stage where we confront the great and growing global energy challenge, the scenery and the players are always changing, as we've seen so sharply over the last five years or so. But the backdrop remains the same. To respond to the pressing concerns of national security, growing global demand, environmental degradation, and economic growth, we must design a sustainable energy future, and we must design it quickly. I've outlined some immediate first steps. First, universities and government should shake off their trepidations about working with both incumbent and emerging energy businesses. Second, the rest of DOE and, frankly, the rest of government should follow ARPA-E's lead in defining competitive cost as central to the clean tech innovation equation. Third, let's figure out how to use the scale of government energy consumption, especially through DOD, to provide test beds for important new technologies. Fourth, we should seize the opportunities of advanced manufacturing to help change the cost equation for new energy technologies. And fifth, we need to develop a range of financing models that will allow energy technologies to develop and thrive in the market. That's my list for today. And I actually omitted a number of areas also crying out for attention, like the need to develop multidisciplinary, highly analytic uh, curricula to educate the next generation of energy pioneers to supplement a rapidly growing workforce. And um, some here may also find it surprising that this to-do list does not include securing a dramatic increase in federal funding for energy research. Look, we need that, of course. But we also need to make the very best use of the resources we currently control and have confidence that our success will catalyze amplified support. With all the drive and talent in this room, and in all the groups all of you represent, we have the power to invent the bright energy future that we need. If we only advance these new models with unrelenting creativity, and in Arun's phrase, with fierce urgency, I know we will certainly change the game. Thank you very much.